The gospel as recorded by Luke, the Gentile physician. Luke, the second chapter, verses 1 through 14. And the King James text today reads as follows. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, unto Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And they were, and there were in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swallowing clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Before I move on with my message, before we pray, I want to read another passage to go with that passage. And I promise you, you're immediately going to say, I'm confused. I, I, I don't understand why the preacher put those two together. But I want to read to you Ezekiel chapter 37, <clears throat> verses 1 through 6. Ooh, hallelujah. Mm. Mm. Oh, it's going to be one of them days. I feel, whoo, glory to God. I feel an anointing coming over me like, like God is pouring hot tar out from heaven. Ezekiel 37, verses 1 through 6. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones, and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest, Again he spake unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. 
Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin this message today. I'm going to preach today on the topic, The Day God Threw Mankind a Bone. Hallelujah. The Day God Threw Mankind a Bone. Glory, Woo, glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Today you shall know that I am the Lord. I am alive and I am well. I care for you. I love you. I embrace you. I have rejected no one. Yea, I have thrown no one aside. Hear me today, saith the Lord. Be restored. Return unto me at this hour, and I will receive you. For I am the Lord. I am the God that loves thee. I am the God that created thee. I am the God that saved me, thee. Hear my voice this hour, saith the Most High. For I am the Lord. Glory to God in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Glory to God in Jesus' name. Master, we love you, God. We thank you. I feel an anointing in the house of God today. I feel the touch of the Holy Ghost in the house of the Lord today. Master, in the name of Jesus, loose the presence and the power and the anointing of God that we feel in this place. Loose it, God, in every room, in every corner, in every crevice where the sound of my voice may go as people watch and listen to this message online, be it live or be it later. Oh God, let the anointing and the presence of God precede me. Master, today in the name of Jesus, go forth and break the bonds that bind. Lord, in the name of Jesus, let the word of God today be like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. Let those who are bound today receive their deliverance as the word of God goes forth. Let those today, God, who are uh, sick in body receive their healing as the word of God goes forth. Let those today who are unsaved, Lord, turn to you and cry out, Lord, for mercy and love as they turn from sin and unbelief to faith in a living God. Restore the backslider, those who have wandered away. Let them today, O oh God, leave this message. Leave this place restored by the power of God to a full and complete relationship with you. Let their walk be brand new. Let them feel the embrace of the Holy Ghost like they've never felt the embrace of the Holy Ghost before. Oh, Master, God is love. Oh, Master, today love them, touch them. We ask it all today in none other than Jesus' wonderful, precious name. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Whew. I want to tell you, I feel the anointing. God must, and it's funny, I, I, didn't, I didn't think it was going to be like this for this message, but apparently it is. 
every time Tommy and I eat out and we have an entree that involves a bone, whether it's a steak or whether it's uh, ribs or whatever the case might be, I make it a point to bring the bones home to my fur babies. I love my fur babies and I spoil them something rotten. And if we go out to eat and stuff, a lot of times, you know, I'll ask Tommy if I'm going to order something that's got a bone, then that means the other dog might not get one. So I'll ask him, you know, are you going to order this or are you going to order that? Because uh, some way i got to make sure they both get their bone. Amen? Amen. I love my babies and I have to bring them each home a bone. Now it may seem like very little, it may seem like precious little to us, but to a dog who lives to eat, <laughs> a bone is the most wonderful treasure and the most precious gift that one can give. Glory. It's my way of saying to my babies that I'm always thinking of them. As the shepherds look down into a hay-lined manger, they surely must have thought, it's just a baby. There's so much expectation attached to this child. Listen to what the angels had to say. Listen to the declaration of the angels. But now that we're here and we're looking, it's just... A baby. There's so much that's expected. But to look at him, all one could see was an infant. What can he possibly do for us? When in reality, listen, his very existence depends upon the care and nurturing of others. What can he do for us? He can't do anything for himself. If it isn't for Mary and Joseph caring for him, he can't even do anything for himself. What can he possibly do for us? But yet the angels made such a powerful declaration concerning him. Oh, children, I want to tell you today, children of God, listen to me. What may look like little to us, what may look impossible in fact to us, can be far much more to those whom it is meant to benefit than meets the eye. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, I bring home that old steak bone. It looks to me like it just, you know, the waste. It looks like it's the throwaway. All the good meat's been cut off of it. All the good meat's been eaten. There's, I'm not giving the dog a steak. I'm giving the dog a bone. I'm just throwing him, you know, the scraps. I'm, I'm giving him the least I could possibly give him. Oh, but to the dog, it's a feast. To the dog, it's the thrill. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you today, people of wealth and power often like to do things as big and ostentatiously as they can. They enjoy flaunting their wealth and showing off. But here in the manger, God was about to do the biggest job ever to be done conquering hell, death, and the grave on behalf of all humanity. And he was doing it by doing little more than throwing mankind a bone. Come on, think about it. He didn't show up on the scene uh, king with a crown and a breastplate sitting on the back of a white horse. No, that would have been the steak and potatoes. That would have been, you know, uh, that would have been the whole shin, uh, shindig. That would have been everything. But no, instead he's throwing man about, here's the baby. 
Lord, Lord, what on earth can this thing do for me? Now, for the next so many years, I'm going to have to care for this baby. I'm going to have to care for this child. I'm going to have to nurture this child. That, how can that kid do anything for me when I'm looking at 18 years of having to care for him? Hello now. My Lord have mercy, all God, all God did, or all it appears God did, was throw mankind a bone. It was the bare minimum, or so it would appear. A king, a king, a king, Christ the Lord, the promised one, the Messiah, the anointed one, who is none other than God himself. A king born not in a castle, not in a palace or a mansion, but in an animal barn. <laughs> not wrapped in fine linens and silk, but the fabric adorned by simple people of modest means. What on earth could the Lord have been thinking? How on earth could a child born in a barn ever amount to anything of substance capable of doing what God alone could do. Oh my goodness. Even in the writing of the Apostle John, we read this sentiment in John chapter 1 verses 44 through 46. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? <laughs> Philip, Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? No one could have imagined that one who emerged from so simple a background as Jesus of Nazareth, raised in the extremely small, Nazareth was an extremely small village. It was a humble town. After having been born in Bethlehem, the city of David, which was a nod to his earthly heritage, tracing back to King David. Now listen, children, here's an important point to remember today. The taxation of Caesar Augustus, first of all, is an established historical fact. For those of you who want to foolishly believe that the Bible is bunk and that uh, Jesus was not a real man and all this foolishness, the fact that he was born in one of the smallest communities in one of the smallest countries on the face of planet Earth to one of the smallest families, people say, well, why, why don't we have a whole lot more read about him? Why don't we have a whole lot more written about him? Sweetheart, you come from those humble beginnings, and there aren't a whole lot of people holding a pen waiting to write about you. Hello now. They looked at him and said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? What? That guy's coming. I grew up in a very small town. I grew up in a town. Now, to some people, I guess the town I grew up in would be a, me a major metropolitan area. But I grew up in a town that had a population in my uh, in the mid '60s, early '70s, around 3,000. Everybody knew everybody. Everybody knew everybody. You knew virtually every house you drove past. You knew who lived there. You know, I used to deliver papers, so I could drive down the roads that I delivered papers on. I knew every customer's name. I, you know what I'm saying? I mean, a very small town. It was very much a Norman Rockwell beginning. You don't have a whole lot of people running around trying to write about me and trying to tell the world about me because, no, I'm not Franklin Graham who was born to a famous preacher daddy. Hello now. 
See, Franklin Graham had done squat for himself. Franklin Graham didn't have to do anything at all to establish himself and to establish his own reputation and his own ministry. His proximity to daddy immediately gave him all kind of press and all kinds of cameras and all kinds of people just sitting there waiting to hear what he has to say on every subject that touches upon Christianity. Am I telling the truth? Oh, I'll tell you where you come from and your background has a lot to do with how much coverage you get where you come from and your background has a whole lot to do with what kind of PR you get and how much you get promoted and how much you know you're looked up to there are people in this world there are people in the church world today who are looked up and admired looked up to and admired and yet in reality they've absolutely done nothing for themselves except they were born into a certain family. But listen, it's a historical fact that the taxation of Caesar Augustus took place. That's a fact. History records it. Interestingly enough, it was this taxation that made it necessary for Joseph to carry his espoused wife, Mary, with him to the town of Bethlehem. The terms of the taxation were that every individual was to return to the place of their birth where they then would present themselves and pay their tribute. But it was this circumstance, some would call it coincidence, <laughs> that made it possible for the Christ child to be born in that city where ancient prophecies had predicted he would be born. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Had it not been for this secular circumstance of this taxation, Jesus might have been born in Nazareth where they were living. But instead, this circumstance that looked entirely disconnected, this circumstance that had nothing to do with an angel saying, do this or do that, this circumstance that was secular in origin, that appeared to be totally disconnected from the story altogether, this circumstance directed Joseph and Mary so that they wound up in Bethlehem when just the time she was to give birth. Oh my goodness. I'm here to tell you today, believer, you may not like your circumstance. Oh my God. You may not care for it. You may not be comfortable. You may not be happy where you're at. If you think Mary was happy, nearly nine months pregnant on the back of a donkey, riding 90 miles from uh, Nazareth to Bethlehem, you got to be out of your mind. You may not be happy. You may not be comfortable. You may not like your circumstance. But God, He Oh, hallelujah, is putting you where you need to be. Glory to God. God is directing you where you need to be. Glory to God. He is using your circumstance to guide you and direct you. There are many examples in the Word of God where the Lord uses circumstances to accomplish his will in the life of his people. So instead of railing against it, accept that circumstance and know that the word of God promises all things work together for good to them that love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Oh my goodness, there's a lesson today in this for us. Sometimes our circumstance is meant to direct us to a place where we need 
to be, a place where we otherwise would not be. Oh, but we need to be there if things are going to fall into place and fulfill God's plan for our lives. Mary may have grumbled in her expectant state all the while she rode an ass from Nazareth to Bethlehem. This was roughly a 90-mile journey. It's about 70 miles as the bird flies, but as we all know, uh, roads and roadways and what have you, don't, they don't always go straight between two points. So it was about a 90-mile journey. In biblical times, that would take about four days, traveling at an average speed of roughly two and a half miles per hour. She was likely uncomfortable. She was likely very unhappy and miserable. But if prophecy was to be fulfilled, she needed to be there. The Messiah was not born in Bethlehem. Listen, because Mary somehow orchestrated it that way in order to fulfill prophecy, but rather God used circumstance to get her to the right place at the right time. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. That bone cannot become a valiant and victorious warrior except that it fulfill all prophecy concerning the Christ. Hallelujah. God threw man a bone. But you know, he also showed us through the prophet Ezekiel. He can do some powerful things with a bone. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. What starts out small, what starts out insignificant, what starts out and looks virtually impossible. Ezekiel looked at a valley full of bones, and they were very dry. These things were so far removed from life, it wasn't even funny. It had been a long time since these bones had had flesh on them. It had been a long time since these bones had had life in them. Oh, but God looked at old Ezekiel and said, Ezekiel, son of man, tell me this. Can these bones live? Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you, looking down into that manger, those shepherds may have looked and said, it's just a baby. <laughs> it's just an infant. What did God do? Throw us a bone? That's all right. If God threw you a bone, it'll work. Because let me tell you, God can do some powerful things with bones. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you, God immediately was bringing the flesh together. God immediately was restoring life to that bone. From the moment that child was born in the manger, prophecy after prophecy after prophecy concerning the Christ began to come together, including his exile into Egypt, am I telling the truth, including the destruction of babies under two. Yeah. All these prophecies begin to become fulfilled, and as each prophecy was fulfilled, listen to me, God was putting flesh back on the bone. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. He was putting the whole thing together. He taught of us a little kind. He may have thrown mankind a bone in that old manger, but honey, immediately he began to speak to that bone, and I'm telling you, flesh began to come, and sin you began to come, and blood began to come, and life began to come, because God had a plan for that bone. And I'm here to tell you, God turned a valley full of dry bones into an army of warriors. I want you to know today, he turned that bone in the manger into a warrior, <laughs> into a champion, into a victor. Glory to God. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. The Lord today loves to use the less than obvious to accomplish His plans and His purposes. He used a ragtag bunch of men from a variety of backgrounds and occupations to establish the foundation of His church. He started His earthly journey in the humblest manner possible.
He did not arrive on the scene a mighty giant sword in hand and breathing fire declaring salvation and, declare, and proclaiming the liberation of Israel. The Jews would have loved that. But sometimes the biggest jobs, oh my Lord, require the smallest tools. You don't need a whole steak dinner. You just need the bone. Hallelujah. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, the word of the Lord said, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form. He was not given a form. He took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you. Some people say, uh, you Christians are crazy. You try to say, your God became a man. Why, that, that's the most idiotic notion that, that God, as big as God is, would you know, humble himself and he would make himself so small as to be manifested among us as a man. I've actually talked to people from other religious backgrounds, Hindu and others, and you know, and, and some people have expressed, well that's just crazy that you know, my God would never do that. My God is God and my God will always stay God and he would never be any less than God. You hear what I'm telling you? Oh yeah, because he got to show up on the scene. If the task is a big task, he got to show up looking big, right? In order to get the job done. But you see, sometimes you don't need the whole steak. You just need a bone. Sometimes a little tool is a tool that will get the job done. I've watched a video on the internet in which a logger fells a huge tree. I mean, this tree is gigantic. It's probably 20 feet around or so. And he does so using only a tiny wedge. The wedge he's using isn't any more than six, eight inches long and maybe two and a half inches wide. That tree, if you were to carve that tree into wedges, you would get millions and millions of wedges out of that tree. If you compare the size of the tree to the size of that wedge. But you know, interestingly enough, having cut down a number of trees myself, and understanding the science behind the method, I'm telling you, I enjoy watching this man bring this tree down. Here's a tree that's easily 20 feet around at its base being brought down through the use of a wedge that is so small, so tiny, so insignificant. The wedge just seems like it would be a waste of time. How on earth can that minuscule, tiny, inconsequential wedge bring down that enormous tree. Well, I'll tell you what the problem is. The saw can't do the job alone. 
It can cut through a good portion of the tree's trunk, but at some point it will become bound and unable to function. You ever use the saw on a tree? Chainsaws, same thing. You go If you're going straight across on the trunk of that tree, guess what? You're going to get to a certain point where the weight of the tree comes down into the crack that you've created, you know, the crevice you've created, and it's going to bind your saw. You got to be careful when you're using a chainsaw as you're cutting certain branches and certain logs. You got to be careful because if it's bent in such a way, if the tree branches bent in such a way that as you cut it, it kind of starts to fold on itself, it's going to bind up that saw blade. It's going to bind up that chain. The man had used the saw and he had cut through that tree a good bit, but now the problem is he can't go any further. Now the saw won't work. Now the saw has done as much as the saw can do. Some people say, well, why didn't he just cut from the other side and meet where he uh, had cut from before? Same problem, honey. It's still going to happen. As he cuts, the weight is eventually going to come down on that saw, and he's not going to be able to finish the job. The saw can't do the job alone. Oh, listen, If even if you cut the remaining portion of the trunk from the opposite direction, the weight of the tree is going to come down. And it's going to bind the blade so you can't complete the job. But now listen to me today. Listen carefully. But what the saw cannot do The wedge can. Did you hear me? I want you to keep that language in your mind a minute. What the saw cannot do, the wedge can. The wedge provides just enough pressure inside the cut created by the blade that it is able to nudge the tree forward from the base and cause the tree to fall exactly where you want it to fall. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 8 verses 2 through 4 says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus have made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, <laughs> in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Hallelujah. Oh, children, the law could only cut through so much of the obstacle that was sin. But in the end, it couldn't do the entire job. So God provided a small, insignificant, oh hallelujah, tiny wedge. <laughs> oh, that was able to do what the saw could not do. What the law could not do. And down came sin. Down came hell. Down came death and the grave. Hallelujah. Victory was ours and it took only the tiniest of tools to get the job done. The Lord God didn't have to send a warrior. He knew how to get the job done and how to get the job done right. I want to tell you today, I'm almost done, believe it or not. What appeared in the manger to be God throwing mankind a bone became the means 
to a mighty victory over sin. As Ezekiel looked upon the valley full of dry bones and God asked him the seemingly insane question, can these bones live? Even so, that morning in Bethlehem, the shepherds may have looked down into that hastily constructed manger and thought to themselves, can this child be the Christ proclaimed to us by the angels? Can this baby possibly be capable of doing for mankind what thousands of years of law could not do? And the answer today is simply this. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. These bones can live. This child can be the Christ. Oh, what appears a bone today will be our Savior tomorrow. That which may appear insignificant, powerless, even helpless today our God is able to fashion into a warrior capable of winning battles no man has ever or could ever win. Today we declare with the angels of the Almighty, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The day God threw mankind a bone. Hallelujah. Did you get it?